Hello again, and welcome to another in our autumn series of Invisible Histories Talks. Our talks are free, but we do, of course, as we always say, welcome donations. And there's a donate button on our website. Today, we're welcoming Peter John Files, beaming in from Sweden to speak on the SDF, the Social Democratic Federation in Lancashire, 1884 to 1918. The library contains a lot of material from the Federation, which Peter has used as part of his research and which everybody is welcome to come and browse. Peter, over to you. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. And uh, thank you for attending this short talk today about the Social Democratic Federation. And um, if we can move straight along uh, to the first slide. <laughs> we will see there, um, move on to the next slide, please. Yeah, perfect. Uh, when I started this project, which was about five years ago for a PhD at Manchester, um, it was um, quite well known that the historiography of the SDF um, was one that uh, most general histories had outlined. You know, the SDF was, the, they were the minor, small, uh, radical brother, uh, little brother of the ILP. They were definitely Marxist. They were anti-union. They were somewhat foreign and alien. Uh, and of course, they had failed. Uh, their contribution to uh, labor history has been summed up in several books by um, Mark Bevere, and of course the, the sort of uh, the Bible of the SDF, if we could call it by, that, by Martin Crick, uh, as, as, you know, not really having contributed that much. Uh, next slide, please. And of course, uh, synodoches and heterotopias are these uh, great academic words that I came across right at the beginning of the study, and they're used by sociologists uh, such as uh, Foucault uh, to describe different types of uh, gatherings of human beings. And that really got me interested right at the beginning um, about studying the SDF, because I, I'd always thought that uh, um, they had been underappreciated. And these kind of sociological terms, without wishing to get too academic, um, started to get me thinking, what is it about groups of people when they get together in politics that makes them um, wondrous or different? Uh, and of course, this man Foucault had talked about uh, people when they get together, especially in political gatherings, uh, behave in certain and specific ways. So that got me quite interested, but I didn't want to do the PhD on sociology. And it was just a nice clue to start to get me looking further. So then I carried on. Next slide, please, Lynette. And here we have, uh, as I started to look, uh, one of the things I came across, I came across another book by another sort of uh, anthropologist this time, called uh, Michael Scott, and he talked about um, how important it was to, to study local histories and how local histories could reveal so much more than just these general or national histories. And of course, that's what I started to do. I started to go around the libraries of um, Lancashire and start to look for information. And sure enough, we come across some um, uh, material very early on that starts to question national histories such as you know I come across the Salford SDF you know and a fantastic story about one of their meetings and at one such meeting very early on uh, you know nothing to do with politics whatsoever the meeting had ended and they had 25 pounds in the kitty and they were skint uh, and someone said well I know a postman who knows a man who races horses and, um, you know, this horse is going to win the Manchester um, Derby next weekend. So, of course, the entire SDF voted to put the entire funds of their kitty on the horse. 
which needless to say, didn't win. And they were 25 pounds down, which you can imagine in those days was quite a lot of money. Uh, then I was digging around in Bolton and came across uh, perhaps one of the reasons why the SDF had struggled so much, because when they were actually taking in um, members at the start, several of the branches had this like vetting system, i.e. you couldn't just join as, as you could many parties by just turning up and paying your two pence. Uh, you had to actually show and prove that you knew a certain amount of socialism. And of course, you can imagine in those days, at the turn of the last century, or should I say, sorry, the century before, uh, you know, people were not very well educated. Uh, departing with two pence would be enough for a lot of people. Parting with two pence and having to take a test um, would probably put off a lot of ordinary folk, ordinary um, working lads and lasses. And then Tom Early, a Blackburn SDF member, um, registered 17,468 votes in one of his um, uh, elections to become a member of the Board of Guardians, but still wasn't elected uh, because he was beaten by um, a Christian priest. Uh, so what these small, you know, initial investigations began to show me was local politics is so much varied and so different to the national general uh, interpretations of this uh, wondrous political party that we have thus far received. Moving on, please, Lynette. Next slide. And then, of course, uh, this is just a, you know, a table showing the uh, predominance. I'm sure we're all aware of our own history in Lancashire uh, of the weavers. Uh, trades and occupations. And, the, you know, here's just four towns uh, in Lancashire, Bolton, Burnley, Rochdale and Blackburn, slightly different numbers for each, but all very much reflecting that, you know, cotton was king uh, in the early uh, 1900s uh, in Lancashire. Uh, next slide, please. And here is a fantastic uh, photo. Uh, the gentleman in the middle there, seated, is none other than John Sparling, who was um, a Social Democratic Federation member in Burnley. And here he is, of course, surrounded by his family of 12 children. Uh, uh, and his wife, of course, just stood there to the right of him. And um, I wouldn't say 12 was the normal number uh, of uh, offspring, but of course, families in those days were very much larger than they are today. And John was very uh, prodigious, if we could use that word, as, as was his wife. Uh, and of course, John was one of the leading SDF members. He was actually, for quite a long period of time, the um, miners' representative in Burnley uh, for the miners' union. Uh, and we'll come back to him a little bit later, but I just put that in there. It's an absolutely fantastic uh, photo of John Sparling and his family uh, in 1903. And I actually managed to make contact with uh, one of his great granddaughters now in America, uh, who supplied me with quite a lot of uh, interesting family information. Next, next photo, please. Yeah, and then moving on, you know, obviously to talk about the SDF at this time, uh, we have to know a little about you know, real life, and it's, it's get, getting harder and harder the longer and longer we move away from it, I think, to get a grasp of it. I mean, I can just about remember from my own mum the stories that she would tell of, um, you know, the First World War and lads coming back from the First World War uh, injured and, you know, uh, affected by it. Uh, and here we have just, you know, I thought this was a really good uh, slide to put up. It's just... Um, uh, a copy of Sparling's family um, food list for the week, uh, which usually would be uh, something you would have to live off on one pound, about 20 shillings. I think the average, I mean, it varied considerably, but uh, the average for a weaver would be about 20 shillings, 22, 24 shillings. And here you can see John's sort of uh, family's uh, uh, weekly food list. Uh, potatoes, quite a lot of, you know, some meat in there, tea and bread, but uh, there's, a, there's a stock, uh, stock um, uh, missing or uh, want for vegetables and fruit, as you can see. 
uh, and of course this was the type of uh, times that we lived in and such diets wouldn't provide for great healthy uh, constitutions either. Uh, moving on, please Lynette. Yes, and then of course, this, and this was sort of what started, what I started to discover as I went further and further through this um, three year investigation was uh, there was a large amount of entertainment that crept up constantly in, in the most surprising of places. Uh, I was doing one, I was in uh, the cooperative in Manchester uh, one weekend and came across some documentation about Keir Hardy and he was about to have a meeting uh, somewhere out there in the Con Valley, and it was uh, postponed because they find out at the last minute uh, that there was a big uh, rugby match going on. And of course, there was no point having the political meeting if it had to compete with the rugby match. And drink, pools, as I'm sure some of you have heard about the football pools, uh, football and culture, uh, weren't very high on people, on working people's um, uh, lists of, of uh, you know, things to do. I deliberately wrote their Blackpool culture because, again, in one of the documents I found, there was a fantastic uh, uh, letter written in by somebody to um, one of the Blackpool newspapers, and um, there'd been a political event that weekend uh, which wasn't very successful and uh, the particular person had, had wrote in the newspaper uh, we are very happy doing what we do and you can keep your culture to yourselves spelt deliberately as it is there on on the slide uh, i think the man in question deliberately spelt it incorrect um, so this was another part of the um uh, of the research that began to grow more and more that entertainment and leisure were very important for people and did affect politics. Uh, next slide, please, Lynette. And then in contrast to that, uh, you have these wonderful organizations that we find in Lancashire, which kind of um, helped people become more interested in politics and their own well-being. Of course, we had the Women's Cooperative Guild, which, of course, the famous Selena Cooper uh, and various other ladies, of course, um, were members of. We had the Club and Institutes Union, uh, Labour Churches, Trade Councils. I'm not saying these organisations were specific just to Lancashire, but they were in Lancashire and they did help, especially the female uh, members uh, of the SDF, become more engaged. And I've, I've got a little slide about that later on. Uh, next one, please, Lynette. And here we have a, a nice little graph of Lancashire just showing density. Unfortunately, it's so small, you can't actually see the statistics there in the, in the top right. But the really dark areas, I think the black areas you can make out are not surprisingly what we would address as you know, the Cotton Town King areas uh, where uh, people were crammed into small town areas and where industry uh, was dominant. Um, and again, these kinds of uh, geographical structures showed me, at least, that um, cultures were very diverse and so were political parties. And I started to get this picture uh, uh, more and more of something that was not homogeneous. And, and I, I use that term uh, quite, quite lightly because it's not something I use every day, but th they were not um, set one entity things as general and national histories very often portray. And that brought me back to the SD, thinking about the SDF again. You know, was it really a single party entity? And, and you know, you, you can guess which direction I'm going. Uh, it certainly wasn't. It was a very, very diverse thing uh, in the end uh, when we get to the conclusion. But carry on, please, Lynette. Next one. And then, of course, we have what I could label the obvious opposition to, you know, socialism and or social democratic federation success. And uh, we have liberalism and paternalism. Uh, liberalism 
was seen, and I was very surprised actually, I, I didn't know that much about liberalism as such, but I was surprised to find that, um, you know, in the 1890s and round to the turn of the century, um, they were seen very much as the working man's party before any socialist or labor party began to develop. Uh, Burnley alone had a liberal um, uh, club and a, a liberal party club membership of over 350 uh, members, mostly male, of course, but uh, and that's you know, quite a significant amount of people to be members of a political party at this time. Uh, the other obstruction, of course, uh, was paternalism. Um, my, my particular mentor at the university wasn't that keen on me highlighting this, didn't think it was that strong an issue, but the more I dug, the more I found out it was extremely strong. And the man in the picture is uh, Mr. Henry Hornbeck, who was, of course, the MP for Blackburn for many years, never made um, a speech in Parliament ever, uh, and um, spent most of his time uh, in his factories working, um, making money, of course, uh, but socialising with his operatives. He was known to go around town with sweets in his pockets and give sweets to the, the workers' kids. Uh, and every time he went into an election, um, the thrust would be, you know, vote for those you know, I'm one of your own. And of course, was, and he was very successful. And of course, the socialists had to work against that kind of um, um, very convincing um, owners or employers um, draw. And then, of course, they also had to work against the trade unions and the Labour Party. Uh, it's always very difficult to start delineating between different groups and their perspectives, but the Social Democrats were, I think we can fa fairly say, uh, socialists, maybe not Marxists, but they're definitely socialists, and many uh, trade union members and uh, Labour Party members were anything but. Uh, if we take the example of Shackleton, the first uh, MP in Nelson in 1902, I mean, you know, the man couldn't get more hostile to socialism if he tried. Um, uh, Irving himself, uh, Dan Irving, who became the MP in Burnley, um, was appalled uh, when he was um, selected to be the um, MP for Nelson. And of course, did his best to uh, work against it. But um, the arrangement had been made. Uh, the Labour Party liked him, uh, the unions liked him, and of course, you know, um, Shackleton himself was more than pleased to get the role. So of course the socialists had um, an history, uh, or the SDF had an history, which they had to work against uh, from their very inception, you know. Uh, so it was always an uphill struggle. Uh, next slide, please. And then moving, I'm going back again to more, what's the cultural opposition? Well, here's a fantastic shot, of course, of, of the you know early days of the football match uh, with all those wondrous flat caps, but um, a very um, prominent um, um, historian, Geoffrey Hill, Professor Geoffrey Hill today. Um, he was from Nelson, actually, Geoffrey Hill. And I, I was, I've talked to him many times over the past five years. And he came up with this fantastic quote in one of his uh, papers, you know, to understand the working class, you need to understand Manchester United and Coronation Street. And I think a lot of national histories, they miss that, they just go past it because we're so keen uh, to put things into easy to understand boxes and labels. And of course, that's what local histories um, don't do and, and actually show complexity, I believe. Next slide, please, Lynette. Then, you know, to, compli to complicate things even more, we've got this um, theme that I've called workers' respectability. And you, you certainly come across, you know, um, you, you can't say that the workers were a group because, of course, you've got all these different types of skills. Uh, you know, we've got miners and, and weavers and uh, um, iron forgers and, and all different types of trades. But then even amongst uh, people that could have been, you know, called uh, working class by Marxists, um, you've got uh, another delineation, which the workers themselves were very aware of. They would call themselves respectable, or they call themselves roughs. So 
So you were like a rough or a respectable. And of course the rough gentleman or the rough worker didn't know quite when to stop drinking. And uh, you know, the rough lady didn't donkey corner uh, doorstep enough, uh, but the respectable ones did. And you get this, this uh, yet, yet another complication. You've got the SDF, which of course is complicated. It's not homogeneous. It's many different strands. And then you've got the workers themselves who, all, who are also most different. And um, the quote there uh, about Cooper and Conway, um, that of course is Catherine Conway and Selena Cooper. They laid the foundation stones at the, what was the initial ILP building in Nelson, which I believe has been renovated just recently. Uh, and of course, on laying their stones, uh, they were quite, quite proud to point out to the newspaper that the ILP was a respectable political party, deliberately using this word. Uh, so respectability really was important to working people. And of course, uh, socialists were very easily portrayed as being not respectable because they were uh, not religious. They were, they were portrayed as being, you know, alien and foreign very often. Uh, next slide, please. Here we have two great pictures of Cooper and Oldsworth uh, and um, Selena on the left there and then Ethel Carney Oldsworth on the right. Uh, two ladies who, who, of course, both fought quite vigorously for socialism, but in, in quite different ways. Uh, Cooper, you know, she um, um, goes through the Women's Institute. Uh, she initially is friends with Dan Irving, uh, but then more and more becomes more of um, an ILP uh, supporter, if you will, uh, and um, le leans more and more towards uh, compromise and supporting initiatives which will help the Labour Party. And Oldsworth is, is the contrast to that. Oldsworth is um, uh, uh, initially from Great Arwood and, and Blackburn and gets a job um, on the Clarion uh, initially, uh, working for Blatchford, and is, is much more a radical and, and refuses to sway on most policies uh, of her socialism and is a constant thorn in the side of, of many uh, um, mainstream politicians and uh, Labour Party politicians as well. Um, so two women, again, both socialists, both using totally different methods um, to achieve their goals. Once again, showing the complexity of uh, history in this period. Next slide, please. And here we go, um, just some points about female politics and uh, the environment at the time. Um, the first one there, no female toilets in the Weavers Institute, used to be the case, of course, in the beginning. Uh, what a good way of, of uh, trying to persuade ladies not to go. Uh, we've mentioned sweet weavers could be respectable and rough. Um, Kenny, uh, Miss Kenny, another um, socialist, um, causes quite a disturbance in Manchester, acting on behalf of the sub suffragettes, comes to Burnley to hold a speech about it. And uh, the people in the audience are not concerned about her so much um, breaking up um, uh, an institutional establishment by standing up, uh, but apparently she was spitting while standing up. And that was the focus. I, and again, how disrespectful to be a lady spitting uh, in an institutional environment. Respectability, it was very important. Next slide, please, Lynette. And here we go, here's um, Grandfather Sparling, as it says there, that's John Sparling, uh, who was um, uh, the miners union organizer in Burnley and a member of the SDF. And here we have some gentlemen on the right who are also um, SDF members. Dan Irving, we probably all know, who eventually becomes uh, the MP for Burnley. Uh, Joseph Shufflebottom was uh, an SDF member in Bolton, uh, lost his wife and his family, went bankrupt, uh, put socialism before all those things, poor chap. Uh, John Tempest, he was hounded out of Burnley for being an SDF man. Tom Hacking, we've mentioned he was um, a Blackburn SDF, George Peeling, Rochdale FDF. And then John Widdup, John Widdup's quite an interesting character. He's also a Burnley lad, 
uh, and he he edits and runs the um, uh, socialist North East Lancashire newspaper, which eventually becomes the Burnley Pioneer. And um, he's very much a man of his own. Um, he has several um, affairs with different ladies um, and leaves Burnley eventually. But uh, early on, whilst he's running the newspaper, him and Hyman come to grips with each other because Hyman wants to close down the local newspapers so that everyone will buy the national SDF. And he actually succeeds in closing down the um, Burnley local SDF newspaper, but um, not that successful because within two years, it, it's uh, re-established itself. And mainly thanks to uh, uh, Widup and the Burnley SDF men. And just in that story alone, you see uh, a very um, interesting and distinct difference between uh, Heinemann and the London SDF, the executive, and these Lancashire branches. These Lancashire branches, you know, they, yes, they were socialists, yes, they would take advice, but ultimately they were the ones deciding what they would do. Very often they were the ones who decided who would be their representative if they were running for um, elections or uh, board of guardians and, and so vera, so etc. Sorry, next slide, Lynette. And then here we have just some more examples of social democratic federation um, activities. I've called it in context and out of context. Um, in context, you've got people like the Reverend Leonard, um, initially from the Congregational Church in Cone. He's the man who sets up the Christian uh, Holiday Association. Uh, and he's extremely interesting because once again, um, he starts this Christian Holiday Association to help improve the workers. And he's appalled at workers going to Blackpool and spending their money on betting and uh, alcohol. So he wants them to do better things. And of course, he sets up this Christian Health Association with the help of many other SDF people. And uh, it, yeah, he does okay. It gets about 800 people to join. And then another 250 go on holiday for the first time and they go on these rambling walks. Um, but when you look at the um, logbook uh, for the walks and the people who are signing them, they're anything but ordinary workers. They're actually people that we would probably consider middle class, such as Ed Masters uh, and um, people with means to actually go on the other days. So uh, though Reverend Leonard had a very good idea, uh, I think like so many SDF people, they didn't really understand the working class that they were trying to improve. And here we have on the right hand side, yet more examples, um, palaces, this was Irving's idea in Burnley. Um, you know, he wasn't that keen on public houses. Uh, so he had an idea to change them into people's palaces. Uh, needless to say, uh, that plan never came off the drawing board. Uh, Widdup went round doing various, John Widdup went round doing various talks throughout Lancashire and then wrote about them. And I, I thought it was absolutely amazing that he would, he would walk around, he, he did, you know, dozens of talks to workers. And then he wrote about them in the Burnley uh, Pioneer, which was the SDF paper. And he called them uh, peregrinations uh, of an SDF member. Uh, um, you know, talk about swallowing Embo's Wazimon and using the uh, dialect uh, language of the upper class or the middle class. And, you know, just alienating himself without even thinking about it. Um, I'll just choose one more though, which I think is another, yet a good example of what I'm trying to emphasize. The Daily Citizen, which was, we could call it a workers paper, was agonizing over what to do uh, about betting. And they uh, abhorred betting and they stood away from it and they refused to have anything to do with it. And then of course, the sales went down and they started to lose money. And of course, eventually in 1913, uh, they came to their senses and realized that they were going bankrupt unless they started to add to their newspaper a betting page where the ordinary workers could see which horses were running <coughs> at uh, you know, their daily races that weekend. Next text, please, Lynette. 
Here he is, the man himself, Dan the man. Um, possibly um, um, a, a fantastic character. Uh, he, he is socialist through and through. You have to admire him for his grit and determination. He gets involved in so many scrapes and refuses to give in. Uh, you know, he implements a sit-in uh, at one of the council meetings back in 1902 when they refused to change the times of the meetings. And of course they had the times when all the uh, weavers were in the weaver's shed. Um, he is reasonably successful in that he wins um, several seats on the boards of guardians. And then of course, as we all know, uh, eventually becomes the MP for Burnley and, and, and does so because uh, he was around long enough to actually um, take some of the time that it built up for people to actually vote, I wouldn't say socialist, but left. And that left party, of course, in 1918 was the Labour Party. Moving on the net, next one. Yeah, and there we just see, that's, that's a photo of uh, Irving's funeral, by the way. Um, and um, you can see, you can imagine how many Burnley MPs would extract that many people if they died. Uh, <laughs> or if they had died uh, in the last couple of years. Um, not, I would, you know, without wishing to be disrespectful, I don't think we get that many people lying in the streets for a dead MP. Uh, but there you go, that's Dan's funeral. Next slide, please. And then we come down to like, where we're getting to sort of, I suppose, the, uh, the conclusion uh, of uh, the SDF and were they unsuccessful? Well, okay, it's, it's hard to say really. It depends how you clarify it or how, you, um, you know, how, how you're going to measure it. I like to think that in lots of ways they were very successful because they actually helped people eventually vote for the only left alternative after the First World War, and that was the Labour Party. So, you know, every SDF man and woman who said you should look after uh, the workers first, or, you know, you should have proper housing and a decent wage, uh, which was, you know, anything but what the Liberals and Conservatives were doing, then you could argue that the SDF certainly uh, contributed uh, to the su later success of the Labour Party. Um, these floors here on the left, I won't go through all of them. Um, I think we've been going quite, quite a while, but um, the, the two things they did out of that list that was really, um, you know, detrimental to them was fight the good fight. So instead of being strategically uh, more skillful, they literally fought every election that they could fight. Uh, and, so, and, like, and Dan Irving was a great example. There was a, a, a by-election in Manchester I can't remember which one it was, if it was Manchester East or Manchester West, and Churchill ran for it, and one of the resident uh, Liberals. And, uh, you know, with like three months to go before the by-election, it was a by-election, um, the SDF decided uh, that they would put somebody up, and Irving was put up for it, uh, and uh, of course came last. Uh, and they did this all the time, they just, they just instead of being strategically smarter, they just fought every, every fight, every election fight they could fight. And of course, we're not successful because, because of it. And then the other point on that list, which I think is very, very important is, yes, they misunderstood workers. They certainly did. Uh, but also they had this great belief in education. Uh, and they thought that if they could educate people, um, they, would, they would make them into socialists. And of course, time and history proved that to not be the case. Uh, next slide, please. Here's the tsunami, as I called it. And uh, the tsunami really was uh, leisure. Uh, and, and, you know, it's, it's easy. I know it's very easy for us to look back, but, you know, I think it was hard for socialists then to really understand, uh, you know, having a pint, going to Blackpool, um, putting away money in these, uh, there were lots of um, weavers uh, employers that had these like savings funds and I, I found quite a lot of them and they were, you know, workers 
would save up money so that they could go on a holiday to Blackpool for five days, or, you know, so they could go to Rough Lee at the weekend. And, you know, I think it was, it's hard, it was very hard for the SDF to understand how such small um, rewards were much more important for ordinary working people than, than politics ever was. Uh, next slide. Yeah, nevertheless, here we have, here we have a fantastic voting sheet uh, return for 1907, and they've got all um, the Burnley wards. And what's quite interesting about it is um, the SDF uh, actually win one ward, but they got more votes than anybody else. So this, the electoral system uh, wasn't working in their favour even back then. Uh, but I think it also shows how, you know, what a good kind of support they had at ground level. And if they'd have had a different electoral system, who knows what the results might have been. Next slide. And then my study finished at the First World War, really. And, uh, and we all know the First World War, uh, you know, it was just uh, as the British Socialist Party had appeared. It's what the SDF really uh, became. And um, uh, we were left with a major conflict where nationalism, you know, trumped socialism, you know, massively. You know, people flocked to nationalism to uh, defend their country. And socialism was really just pushed to one side quite easily. Uh, and then what I find really interesting, and th th these are two quotes here at the end, I think are great, because when Irving was elected to be MP for Burnley in 1918, he made this long speech, which was in the Burnley Express. And, it, and he, he was very grateful and he was very pleased, but he kept saying, and he repeated it several times, that he couldn't understand why the SDF weren't even more successful. And he couldn't understand why weavers uh, would continue to tolerate such poor wages and such bad conditions. And he was actually reinforcing what I was saying at the end of my thesis, that uh, the SDF didn't really understand uh, the people they were trying to convert to socialism. And then the last quote at the end there, fantastic quote by um, Ivan Maiske, Ivan Maisky was the Soviet um, uh, uh, ambassador to Britain, and he went on a tour of the North, uh, hoping uh, that he could find some uh, socialists uh, and uh, convince them to communism. And he came to Burnley, and he and I got this from uh, his book that he wrote at the time. Uh, and he and he said, you know, of uh, of the workers, there's just three things they're interested in, unfortunately, and that's beer the working men's club and sport. And I think he got it on the nail. And that's the end of that. That's the story of the SDF uh, in Lancashire from my own particular opinion. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much indeed, Peter. That's a, a, a huge amount of research that you whizzed through there. Obviously a lot more you, you could have told us and people might want to ask about particular aspects of it I would um, I would uh, like to thank you on behalf of everybody and also say uh, that as I, I know you're a very very strong Burnley fan so I'm amazed and delighted that you gave Manchester United a, uh, a name check and not Burnley FC uh, <laughs> maybe, that, maybe that's about to crop up um, would anybody like to wave at me if they want to ask a question or make a comment John Harrison would you like to unmute yourself, John? Hi, thanks for that, Lynette. Hello, Peter. Hi, John. Um, you, your focus has uh, been uh, entirely on really East Lancashire. Uh, and as you'll be aware, I'm from Chorley. Um, I, I haven't found much uh, involvement of, of SDF in, in the Chorley area. Um, would be that is what you'd expect, or do I need to look harder? Uh, I didn't look at Chorley, John, so maybe you maybe you need to just look a bit harder. I looked at Rochdale, Bolton, Blackburn, Burnley, Accrington, Nelson, 
and I did a lot of research um, in Manchester and Salford, but um, I had to I had to get rid of all the Manchester and Salford material um, yeah. because the uh, examiners thought that the, it was getting a bit unwieldy, and yeah. I was advised to just stay to, to the four times. But I didn't look at Chorley, so you never know, John. Maybe there's stuff there. No, I was just thinking, wondering whether it was something to do with Central and West Lancashire. Preston, for example, you, you, you haven't looked at? I didn't I didn't look at Preston either, no. And oh, okay. it's just because I was based in Burnley, so I kept it round, round North East Lancashire. Yeah. OK, thanks. Cheers, Peter. Yeah, cheers, cheers, John. Cheers, John. Yeah, more to do. We always like to leave people with tasks to do, so there you go, John. <laughs> um, Nick. Uh, Nick Mansfield is asking a question. Would you like to unmute yourself, Nick? Yep. Uh, 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 we can hear you. Yeah, I'm um, uh, you. You talked a bit about the, the First World War. Um, I, I, I tend to think that, that socialists were much more um, subtle about their attitude to the First World War at the time. And um, I wonder, and you find that in all the left-wing political parties, Hyman, for example, was very jingoistic and ultimately left and joined the Tories. Um, what did you find within the local SDP of support for the war? I mean, you, it, with the ILP even, you do find uh, ILP members joining up as well as being conscientious objectors. Yeah, I'm, uh, I have to be straight with you, Nick. Uh, I sort of, um, I didn't do any, um, I kind of stopped at 1914, really. Right. And I didn't, I didn't do any further digging around in the local branches uh, after that point. I was just uh, um, aware of the fact that, um, both Eyman and Irving um, uh, created, I think it was called the National, they, they, they turned into a, an, an organization called the National Emergency. Yeah, uh, Workers yeah. War Emergency National yeah. Committee. The, the, the minutes are in the People's History Museum. All right, yeah, yeah. So, sorry, Nick, I didn't, I didn't really, I mean, no. that's, that's for somebody else, I suppose. Yeah. There you go. Somebody else's PhD. We're, we're finding a lot of things that, that uh, however much you manage to dig and find out, there's all, there's always more. And uh, yeah, that's a great thing for a librarian to be able to say. So yeah, come and use us. Come and use the Lab History Archive at People's History Museum, uh, County Record Office in, in Preston, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, um, and uh, while I remember, um, you're right about uh, the the Unity Hall in Nelson has just reopened uh, very recently with the Selena Cooper exhibition and we've been pleased to be able to send them across some some clarion material and uh, some other material um, photo material which they've used in pop-up banners and so that's great uh, to be able to welcome the Unity Hall in Nelson as a, as a new place for people to go and, uh, and view in terms of labour history and you um, yeah I know Nick wrote about um, uh, labour buildings so uh, you'll you'll be pleased to, to see that that's open I'm sure Nick. Um, right, has anybody else got yes? Mike Richardson, would you like to unmute? Right, yeah, Mike Richardson. Uh, thanks for that talk, Peter. Um, Hi, Mike. It's not my um, total area, but I'm from Bristol, and Dan Irving came from Bristol. And it's a comment I'm making on that. He originally came out of the Liberal Party, and it was the strike wave in the late 1880s in Bristol when he had a debate by a guy that was in the Bristol Socialist Society about the strengths of Liberal and of um, the New Socialist Party. Uh, he wasn't convinced at that time, but once the strike wave went over, he realised that direct action did, did bring results, and, and that's why he tripped to Labour. Now, the question I'm really coming to, how much do you look at the background of the people in the local community? Because it seems to me these people, and Dan Irving's example, he's probably wanted to find a, a, a safer area where he could perhaps get elected. And incidentally, Annie Kenny was in Bristol as well at one time. So there's a cross-fertilisation here. It's not just local, 
it's ever local and that's the comment I want to make really. Yeah and uh, if I remember rightly Michael I don't have my notes with me but uh, uh, Irving was with an, another socialist not his wife he was married but he joined up with another socialist lady and they lived together which was seen as you know not the greatest thing in the world uh, and then they moved from Bristol, where is it? Was it Sarah Reddish? No, or Catherine? No, no it Catherine was Glazier's wife. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah it was Glazier's wife. Yeah, yeah. there was yeah. a lot of scandal around about it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. And then they moved all three of them up to this uh, colony at Starthwaite, I That's believe. Right, Starthwaite. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and then. Um, then Dan got evicted, or they all got evicted eventually from the colony. And then he ended up doing, uh, Dan ended up going around doing um, uh, socialist speakers to us in North East Lancashire, uh, sometimes with Sarah Reddish from yeah. Bolton. So yeah, you do see that quite often, uh, Michael, where they, they're, they're interconnected, you know, you, and you'd come across Socialists who no, who've known socialists, you know, so they do they do bump into each other quite often. I'm sure I'm sure somebody could write about that as well. Actually, <laughs> well, I've written a local pamphlet for Bristol Radical History Group on what he did in Bristol. But I was, I was looking at this cross fertilisation, and that's another aspect I think, as well as the cultural and the inter arguments, if you like, within the Socialist Party. Yeah, so and then and then you get the uh, the Reverend Leonard that he talked about. Uh, in the presentation a little, who's in Cone and Nelson, and he actually, um, he's the priest who marries Selena Cooper. Right. So, you know, they, they do these bits, come across every now and again, where, where they interconnect. So, I, and I got the feeling, I mean, it's hard to prove, of course, but I definitely got the feeling that these, this, these small socialist groups in Lancashire, uh, they, they knew each other, uh, uh, and uh, they would have correspondence with each other. And you see that in, I find three, three SDF, man, M, um, SDF men were arrested for um, free speech. They, very, they did this free speech campaign, which again, didn't help them at all because it was portrayed as being, uh, you know, not respectable uh, to want to challenge the law and challenge uh, what the council had said about where you could speak and not speak. And, uh, you know, three people got arrested uh, and one of them uh, was from um, uh, the SDF executive and two of them, uh, one of them was um, from Manchester SDF and one of them was from Blackburn SDF. Uh, Hurley and um, Skevington, I think it was called, from Manchester. So there is this, you do come across it all the time where they definitely were, they were definitely were talking to each other and having correspondence with each other. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, thanks, Mike. And a quick plug for the, the radical, Bristol Radical History Group pamphlet. It's a great, uh, great range. And, and we've got a lot of them in the library. You want to come and have a browse or have, have a look on their, their website. Um, now, Yvonne, I think that that, that last answer do, does go some way towards uh, answering what you were saying. Not that much about women. Um, but uh, you point out Wiggins Weavers President Helen Silcox spoke at the SDF meeting alongside women like Eleanor Marx in 1895. And anything else to add about, about women's involvement, Beaton? Uh, well, it, it's very, very difficult to find material about them. Uh, I mean, Cooper uh, was the one who, that brought up most information. Um, and of course, where you find information, you follow that track, you know. So I found a lot about Cooper, but I think Cooper very early on, sort of, you know, after 1902, uh, moves away from the SDF and, and starts, you know, uh, being more of what we call an ILP uh, person. And then the Oldsworth stuff, I've got a load of material from um, Roger, uh, who's just, oh. just, just wrote a book about... Roger Irving. Smalley. Roger Smalley, yeah. Uh, who's just wrote a book about Irving, which is a great little book. Um, but he'd also done a dissertation on um, Oldsworth when he was at Lancaster. And uh, great, great material. So they both, because those two, I find a lot of material, I followed those two ladies. And then of course you do come across uh, other ladies or other women, lasses, uh, 
that are mentioned. And of course, if you had time, you perhaps should follow them and, and dig them. I, I'm sure there's like at least, you know, another half a dozen female socialists in northeast Lancashire that you could probably tell stories about. Uh -huh. No, Yvonne has, does do a lot of digging in, in, in those kinds of areas. So, yeah, keep on with it, Yvonne. Keep on Julian, you, you, oh, sorry, you've got more to say, Peter. No, no, keep on with it, Yvonne. Yeah, okay, yeah, Julian's got his uh, hand up. So, yeah, go for it. Okay, I, absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm, the, the, the thing that completely floored me was to discover that T.A. Leonard was in the SDF. I, I, I simply would not have conceived, you know, because I, I, I know about T.F. T.A. Leonard through the C.H.A. and the rambling and all that side of things. And for him, who was this huge pillar of respectability and all that, to, to actually have been in the S.D.F. is a really sort of extraordinary illustration of just how porous these these groups were. Yeah. And, which yeah. leads me, in a sense, sort of to me, to me, the real question, which is, I'm largely a national man myself. I don't, you know, I've not done the delving in the local that you have, Peter. But the image you have of the national is that people are always coming in and out, and very often being kicked out of the SDF. You know, that that is the picture that they all, all these Labour people, all sorts of people end up, you know, in Labour positions and leading folks. And they've been kicked out of the SDF. Yeah, yeah. Just wondering whether in all this, uh, whether at the local level, any of your SDF people felt sufficiently strongly about things that they said, no, you really can't be in the SDF. Did you get, is there any evidence of that or were they all really quite happy mixing together and matching? Yeah, no, 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 no. There, there were lots of examples of infighting uh, amongst the locals as well. Um, a great example, um, uh, Dawson, the miners' leader mm. uh, in Burnley, he sort of runs for like um, uh, a guardian position in Burnley uh, and he's in the SDF and Dan Irving's sort of the leader of the SDF there. And um, Dan wants him to run as socialist. Um, and he says, no, I, I'm not going to run as socialist. I'm going to run as Labour independent. Uh, and, you know, they have a massive falling out about it. Mm -hmm. and, and Dan wants to get him, you know, removed. Um, he, he certainly gets him removed from uh, attending the meetings, at yeah. the local meetings. But um, whether he's removed, you know, whether he's had his membership extracted, I never, never located. Uh, and th those things are quite difficult to ascertain, Julian. Like, um, uh, um, what you call Selena is a great example. We know she joins the SDF uh, because um, we've got notation of her being at SDF meetings. Uh, but at no point ever can I, or did I, or maybe others, uh, could locate when and if that ends. You know, yeah. you know, in 1903, what do you do if you leave the SDF? Uh, you just leave. You don't write, you don't sign a piece of paper saying, yeah. I'm leaving. <laughs> so, you know, those things are quite hard to, to pinpoint. Mm. But, but it's, it's great, Julian, that, uh, you know, the, there are these, again, they're, they're just, it's like the, the further you go down, the more complicated it gets. Yeah, like a, I can... I, I appreciate that. Many things. I still think. I still think. You know, of course, there's a need for national stories and, and generalizations because it helps us understand. Uh, but I think more local studies would certainly throw mm. greater light onto how complex these political parties were. Yeah, yeah. I buy that. Yeah. 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 Thanks. 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 Yeah, thank, you, Julian. Thank, you. thank you, Julian. On that same side about T. A. Leonard, you had. Joseph Toole of Salford, SDF Oath. And I was quite, given, given that we're a Salford institution, I thought, oh, that, that sounds like something we might want to hear about. Could you just tell us about that? Yeah, that's great. So uh, he writes his own book many years later when he's left. And um, he was um, quite a prominent member of the Salford SDF. And he says at the end, uh, when he first turned up to join the SDF, there was this list of things uh, on a list uh, that you had to abide with. Again, it's going back to that point about 
uh, just joining uh, the Independent Labour Party, you probably just turn up, pay tuppence, and you're in. The SDF, you've got to read through their documentation and agree to, uh, you know, their political programme. And uh, Joe Toole said, when he read through the first two or three things on the list, he said, my goodness me, if I went home and told the neighbours this, you know, they'd throw me out of, they'd throw me off the street. And one of the things on the list at the end was to denounce the Queen. <laughs> and of course, you know, denounce the monarchy and the Queen. And he said, and he actually admitted years later, he never told anybody about that because he knew if he did, you know, he'd be curtains. Right, okay. That's, there's a good Salford angle. Uh, has anybody else got anything that they want to contribute or ask about? Phil, do you want to unmute? Hi there, yeah, I just wanted to... Um, Hi Phil. Hi there. I just wanted to pick up on um, Peter's point about how uncompromising the, uh, the SDF actually were. I did a study of the um, SDF branch in Ilkeston in Derbyshire. And they issued a newspaper called The Dawn between uh, 1900 and 1903. And they literally tore shreds off king, clergy, all political parties, the trade unions, you know, all, almost everybody. And um, although there was some indication that they um, initially participated in the, um, the Labour Representation Committee, which was the, the, the meetings to you know, form the Labour Party, they, I think they quickly pulled out. And I don't know if that was a local or a national decision. Um, but um, it's interesting who these people actually were as well. They, they weren't draw, drawn from the rank and file, the rank and file, sorry. They, were, they, they weren't miners, they weren't textile workers. The ones in Ilkeston were furniture salesmen. Uh, they were publicans, they were bicycle salesmen, fruit and veg shop owners, you know, that, that kind of person. Um, probably slightly better educated than, um, than most of the, uh, you know, the, the real working class that they, they wanted to convert. Um, but it's interesting, the, um, by 1908, there was obviously some kind of split uh, and I think the local SDF, uh, by the time the newspaper pops up again in 1912, during the national miners strike, they were members of the British Socialist Party. They were still pretty uncompromising because three of them were arrested for suggesting that the working class should arm themselves and start shooting at the, <laughs> at the uh, troops and police during the first national uh, miners strike uh, during, uh, in 1912. So you, you can get a, um, a similar view of how, um, you know, lacking in strategy, uh, they, they ultimately were, they were purists, but probably like you said, doomed to failure. Uh, and that's it's really interesting that Nick, because it, it, it's, oh. what I, it's what I've discovered as well. The local executive or the local leader of that SDF group shaped that SDF group. So Irving in Burnley, he was quite a canny politician. And, you know, he was radical, but he still made friends with trade unionists. And then you've got um, the local uh, SDF leader in Nelson. He's much more radical. He's, he's getting arrested, you know, twice in two years. And, he, and he's, he's not really being politically savvy. He's just staying to, he's staying to his socialist principles and doing what socialism says he should do. And so, you know, the local groups are formed very often by one or two men in charge. Good okay, I've got, the, I've got a question in the chat from Julian Wilson, which I'm going to take as the last one unless anybody waves at me. So, so just be thinking about that. So uh, in terms of religion and respectability, he's talking about um, secularist movement uh, and SDF. And he's looked at the Tunbridge Wells branch, which was uh, very much full of militant atheists in 1886, but moderated over time, even recruiting the minister from the Primitive Methodist Church later on. And that probably helped it win seats on the council. He says, were there any similar examples in Lancashire? Uh, of... Um... Um, of, of a move, I guess, a move from um, militant athe atheism or secularism to, to, uh, to a more moderate version. 
Exactly, yeah. Sorry if I hadn't made it clear. Oh, there you go. It, yes, thank you, Judy. I put it in chat because of my cough, so, uh, you yeah, know. <laughs> um, I didn't come across any, any, anything like that, Julian. Uh, I did come across um, Methodists and Congregationalists who were SDF members. Uh, so you do, you, and that's like um, Burnley, Nelson and Cone. You, you definitely get this like Westphalian Methodism um, support for some of the SDF members and the branches. Uh, but I didn't know, not, not, no atheist um, uh, sources. But did did they uh, did they moderate their their views over the over the did the Methodists come in later? Well, I mean, no. If we if we're thinking, you know, about um, the Reverend himself in Cone, mm -hmm. uh, then no, he, he's you know he he comes from um, an organisation, uh, a Methodist organisation. He turns up in Cone. Uh, he, he sees socialism as being very close to Methodism uh, and um, sees it as quite a natural step to take to try and assist the workers um, and, and take his own, make his own endeavours to do that. On a personal note, I always like to hear about radical Methodism. OK, folks, are we, are we, are we there? Have we got anybody else wanting to say anything? Peter, hopefully you've, you, you've heard from people who are doing a lot of research themselves or yeah. you've sent off to do some more research. So that's good, yeah. isn't it? It's, uh, I, I, yeah. can see, I can see John Harrison down there. Thanks, thanks, John, for all the help. I can see he's uh, one of our labour history uh, guys who helps us a lot. All right, brilliant. Well, that's good. Yeah, yeah, always, always good to have a... We always have a great knowledgeable audience here and it's, it's always so nice to have everybody participating. Peter, thank you so much. We're, we're, we're really pleased to have had you with us uh, over from Sweden. Folks, if you joined us late or if you want to recommend this talk to others, it's been recorded and it will it'll be uploaded to the library's YouTube channel with a link on the events web page. Next week's talk is both online and in person. Please do come and join us at the library if you can. There are details of how to book free tickets on the event web page. No need for a ticket though, if you're joining us online. A special note, the next week, we're going to be on a Tuesday, not a Wednesday as usual, and at the earlier time of 1.30 p.m. for our event to celebrate Black History Month. So please do join us if you can on Tuesday, the 26th of October at 1.30 p.m. when we'll be welcoming Shamim Mia and Mike Makin Wait to discuss aspects of race relations along the M62 corridor and in East Lancashire. Till then, best wishes to you all in solidarity from all at the Working Class Movement Library. Goodbye. Bye.